Thank you very much, everybody, and uh, thank you to the Strand for letting us have this event here. What a beautiful room, right? Um, this, uh, this, this book has been about two years in the making, um, and it's, it's been a very special book to me. It's the, the first book I've ever made really not for myself. Um, and it doesn't technically get launched until next week, but the the timing of everything and the the occasion seemed to me anyway to for for cause for uh an unusual celebration and whenever i put my heads together with with some of my closest friends about what's the best way to put this book out into the world um we had the idea that maybe we get some friends together some people together and and we share some readings about some of the greater ideas that that are encompassed in my book and in thinking about that and thinking about the, the themes of the book, the pillars of the book, um, I, it seemed to be covering three major themes. Now, firstly, this, this book came about because completely by accident. Um, not to say that my son was an accident. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, did, I started writing the book without realizing that it was a book. Uh, and when I realized and had finished writing the book, I realized this isn't just a book about being a new parent. This is a book about being a socially responsible and an environmentally responsible human being. And it's also about realizing Earth's place in space. And so with those three notions, I thought maybe a way to share some of the, the, the grandeur of the, what we all feel and know and love about our planet um, and have some of my favorite people come along and read something that they have selected uh, that spoke to them about one of those, those three aspects. Uh, and so really, without waiting anymore, I would, I would like to introduce a uh, wonderful humanitarian, global humanitarian, an author of uh, an inspired book, She Persisted, Chelsea Clinton. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Oliver, for that introduction. Thank you for writing uh, Here We Are and for uh, all of the books that bring such joy uh, to my family um, every day. I'm incredibly grateful for the chance to help celebrate um, Here We Are by quite being here um, with all of you. Uh, I was asked to reflect on uh, being a parent. Um, and so um, sharing uh, a letter that F. Scott Fitzgerald wrote to his daughter, uh, Frances, whom he uh, affectionately um, called both Scotty and Pie. Uh, so this is a letter he wrote her. She was 11 years old. She was away at summer camp, uh, August 8, 1933. Dear Pie, I feel very strongly about you doing duty. Would you give me a little more documentation about your reading in French? I am glad you are happy, but I never believe much in happiness. I never believe in misery, either. Those are things you see on the stage or the screen or the printed page. They never really happen to you in life. All I believe in in life is the rewards for virtue according to your talents and the punishments for not fulfilling your duties, which are doubly costly. If there is such a volume in the camp library, Will you ask Mrs. Tyson to let you look up a sonnet of Shakespeare's in which the line occurs, lilies that fester smell far worse than weeds. I think of you, and always pleasantly, but I'm going to take the white cat out and beat his bottom hard, six times for every time you are impertinent. Now did you react to that? Half wit, I will conclude, here are things to worry about. Worry about courage, Worry about cleanliness. Worry about efficiency. Worry about horsemanship. Things not to worry about. Don't worry about popular opinions. Don't worry about dolls. Don't worry about the past. Don't worry about the future. Don't worry about growing up. Don't worry about anybody getting ahead of you. Don't worry about triumph. Don't worry about failure unless it comes through your own fault. Don't worry about mosquitoes. Don't worry about flies. Don't worry about insects in general. <laughs> Don't worry about parents. Don't worry about boys. Don't worry about disappointments. 
don't worry about pleasure, don't worry about satisfactions. Here are things to think about. What am I really aiming at? How good am I really in comparison to my contemporaries and my abilities in regard to scholarship? Do I really understand about people and am I able to get along with them and what more could I do? Am I trying to make my body a useful instrument or am I neglecting it? And while he ends the letter there with his dearest love signing it, Daddy, I like to think that if he were to write this letter now, he would ask, what are you doing to help protect the planet that we share for your and our future? Thank you very much. Thank you, Chelsea. Uh, so when I was making this book, and in general, I read a lot of non-fiction things, uh, writings that inspire me beyond just the, uh, the, the best-selling fiction that you'll find in the ground floor of this wonderful bookstore. And often, where I get my ideas for what to read next come from the, the brain of Maria Popova, who is the brains behind uh, brainpickings.org. And actually, Maria, in a testament to you, and you may not know this, but I, I changed the subtitle of this book based uh, after I went to an event that you organized in uh, Pioneer Works in Red Hook, where Maria managed to convince how many people, 800 people, to show up for an evening of poetry reading in Brooklyn, um, about not just poetry, but poetry about science. And all of the, uh, a lot of the books that were referenced in that um, were, were scientific and, and uh, uh, reference books. And originally my subtitle had, I was battling between three or four different versions of things you need to know or lessons for Earth. And I just felt that they, as, as my wonderful assistant Hannah put out, it was way too mansplaining. And uh, <laughs> it was, um, it, but it did, it felt, like, it, it felt like it was coming from a place of I know something and you don't, and which was not the case at all. Um, there was a, a degree of humility about this book. And I realized that the subtitle of so many of the books that were referenced in the, this poetry reading session were notes on, and that's exactly what this felt like. Um, but Maria, you've been a, a constant inspiration to me, and um, please, I would like you to share. Thank you, Oliver, for this lovely introduction. And funnily, I'm going to read from a book by my collaborator at the reading that Oliver mentioned, The Universe in Verse. Uh, she's an astrophysicist and a novelist and a writer of wonderfully poetic prose. Her name is Jana Levin. And her um, most recent book, actually, which I just saw downstairs, is called Black Hole Blues. And it's about the century-long quest to discover gravitational waves, which just won the Nobel Prize in physics. Um, but remarkably enough, she wrote the book not only before the Nobel, but before the discovery was made. Um, but I'm going to read from her first book, which came out 15 years ago, and it's called How the Universe Got Its Spots. And it's a very kind of unusual format. It's a series of diary entries um, that managed to tell the story of modern cosmology and modern physics, from Newton to relativity and beyond, but in this beautiful, lyrical, narrative way. And when it came out, it created kind of a new aesthetic, the way that Radiolab has done for science storytelling on the radio. Um, so this is a passage I'm going to read that appears under a diary entry from January 11, 2000. My generation grew up after a man had walked on the moon, Apollo 1 had fallen to tragedy, and Apollo 13 had defied tragedy. I knew about supernovae and stellar evolution, galaxies and space. I was enthusiastic about NASA, the future, and space travel. But it was no longer sheer fantasy. It was all possible. We weren't jaded, but maybe we took for granted that nature was knowable and accessible. Then there are times when nature alludes to our place in the larger scheme of things. Dad and I used to run along the beach at night in Helton Hid Island, South Carolina, and when we clocked in, our miles would collapse onto the sand along some fallen reed. But it wasn't the ocean we'd look at. With no streetlights on the island, the ground was seeped in blue-black darkness, obscuring the beach, which, could, which we could hear but could not see. There it was, 
the Milky Way. I can't remember the first time I saw that milky rift of stars cutting through the sky. I know it was on the island that I saw it in its real splendor, but time stood still for me while I looked agog, and each time it's like the first time, so they all bleed into a timeless picture of that edge-on view of our galaxy. That's our galaxy, I'd say to myself, with a peculiar combination of belief and disbelief, as though for the first time I understood my childhood lessons. The ground dark, the sky so bright you would choke with surprise, I could virtually feel the rolling of the earth under this blanket of stars. Dad would ask me what little I knew about astronomy and I'd babble because I tended to get excited and talk too much, but this was one of those occasions when he didn't mind. We saw remarkable things those nights, haunting images seared in my mind from shooting stars to light so strange and random that I didn't even try to guess what they might be. Now I know simultaneously more and less. Each answer I learn releases a rainfall of new questions. While we try to determine the nature of our ultimate end, we can decipher our common beginnings. Jan 11, how the universe got its spots. Thank you. Um, a big part of my life over the, the last two years or so has, uh, has been having a, a presence on social media and speaking up about things that I believe in. And one of the people who has inspired me to, to do that, and in a way, not where you're just complaining, but uh, you're actually doing something about it, is my, my good friend, uh, poet and humanitarian, Jordan Houston. And I would like to wish Jordan publicly luck reading her selection. I think she's got the trickiest reading tonight. It's a beautiful piece of writing. Please, Jordan, come up. Um, I'm about to read some poetry about science, so please bear with me. Um, it's a selection from This Connection of Everyone with Lungs by Juliana Spar. There are these things, cells, the movement of cells and the division of cells and then the general beating of circulation and hands and body and feet and skin that surrounds hands, body, feet. This is a shape, a shape of blood beating and cells dividing. But outside of this shape is space. There is space between the hands. There is space between the hands and space around the hands. There is space around the hands and space in the room. There is space in the room that surrounds the shapes of everyone's hands and body and feet and cells and the beating contained within. There is space, an uneven space, made by this pattern of bodies. This space goes in and out of everyone's bodies. Everyone with lungs breathes the space in and out as everyone with lungs breathes the space between the hands in and out as everyone with lungs breathes the space between the hands and the space around the hands in and out as everyone with lungs breathes the space between the hands and the space around the hands and the space of the room in and out as everyone with lungs breathes the space between the hands and the space around the hands and the space of the room and the space of the building that surrounds the room in and out as everyone with lungs breathes the space between the hands and the space around the hands and the space of the room and the space of the building that surrounds the room and the space of the neighborhoods nearby in and out as everyone with lungs breathes the space between the hands and the space around the hands and the space of the room and the space of the building that surrounds the room and the space of the neighborhoods nearby and the space of the cities in and out as everyone with lungs breathes the space between the hands and the space around the hands and the space of the room and the space of the building that surrounds the room and the space of the neighborhoods nearby and the space of the cities and the space of the regions and the space of the nations and the space of the continents and islands and the space of the oceans and the space of the troposphere and the space of the stratosphere and the space of the mesosphere in and out in this everything turning and small being breathed in and out by everyone with lungs during all the moments. Then all of it entering in and out, 
the entering in and out of the space of the mesosphere, in the entering in and out of the space of the stratosphere, in the entering in and out of the space of the troposphere, in the entering in and out of the space of the oceans, in the entering in and out of the space of the continents and islands, in the entering in and out of the space of the nations, in the entering in and out of the space of the regions, in the entering in and out of the space of the cities, in the entering in and out of the space of the neighborhoods nearby, in the entering in and out of the space of the building, in the entering in and out of the space of the room, in the entering in and out of the space around the hands, in the entering in and out of the space between the hands, how connected we are with everyone. The space everyone has just been inside of everyone, mixing inside of everyone with nitrogen and oxygen and water vapor and argon and carbon dioxide and suspended dust pores and bacteria mixing inside of everyone with sulfur and sulfuric acid and titanium and nickel and minute silicon particles from pulverized glass and concrete. How lovely and how doomed this connection of everyone with lungs. Thank you. Thank you, Jordan. Talk about getting a dose of perspective on your life. Um, so next up is uh, this, this guy who I know um, called John Cheska, um, who took me under his wing when I, when I first sort of appeared on the scene in the, uh, the publishing scene in, in the USA. And John, I'm sure you're very aware of his work. And I can now say this with... Uh, Honesty is a grandfather of the the current contemporary literary uh, chapter, um, and is one of the greatest voices I think in contemporary storytelling. John. Whoa! Thanks, Oliver. Well, I think I'm here for more than that, too. Um, I'm actually here as a newly minted grandfather. Uh, like two months worth. Thank you. I passed along my DNA years ago. That's about all I did. Um, but I'm here within that perspective. Because um, being a grandfather just gave me this seismic shift in looking at the world. And now the world looks like a much scarier place now. <laughs> I'm kind of sorry that we're passing it along to you fellows. <laughs> Best of luck with that. And I'm worried about more stuff now. But the other great piece about being a grandfather, um, the silver lining is I get to be that guy standing on my lawn yelling at you. <laughs> like, get off my lawn, kid! Um, also, I'm that guy who can be in the back of the bar shaking my finger at you going like, I'll give you some advice. Let me tell you this thing. <laughs> so that's what I thought I'd do now. I'm going to tell you this thing. Um, I've read a lot of books, many of them bought from this very store here, this one included. Um, and some of my best books I realize now in my grandfatherly old age are, and some of the wisest books and stories I've ever read, are Zen koans, jokes, and kids' books. And then I thought about these three things that I love the most and realized they're all kind of the same thing. You can't explain them. They're experiential. You read them, and you either get them or you don't. And nobody's going to explain them. So here they are, live. A monk was looking for enlightenment, and he asked his master, please give me instructions. The master said, have you had breakfast? The monk said, yes. So the master said, then wash your bowl. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I'm not explaining it. Just <laughs> let it happen. Also, similar to that, I taught elementary school for quite a while here in New York before I wrote for kids. And one of my favorite jokes for all time that I've ever heard came from a first grader. And it's, what is brown and sticky? A brown stick. <laughs> <laughs> also, I realized that's what makes some of my favorite books, like Go Dog Go. 
dog. <laughs> Big dog. Little dog. Big dogs and little dogs. Black and white dogs. Or I think my all-time favorite in this book, a red dog on a blue tree. A blue dog on a red tree. A green dog on a yellow tree. <laughs> you can't argue with that. And I would just like to leave you with a little bit more Zen wisdom from James Marshall and his characters, George and Martha. This would be story number three, because it's the third story in the book, <laughs> which is also just great. <laughs> the tub. George was fond of peeking in windows. <laughs> you can see him peeking in the window. I'll have, for those of you in the back. One day, George peeked in on Martha. That would be Martha in the tub. <laughs> and for the resolution of this story, that is George with the tub on his head. <laughs> he sure never did that again. <laughs> we are friends, said Martha, but there is such a thing as privacy. <laughs> Here we are. <laughs> Uh, when we were talking about what John would read, uh, one of the, the things that he thought he might read was advice from the 14th Dalai Lama. And one of the aspects of this book, and some, some of the, the teachings that I have tried to instill in, in my son that certainly were instilled in me, were about the notion that, yes, while we're all unique individuals sort of living, you know, we're all playing the, the starring role in the film of our lives, there are seven billion of us here uh, and so the secret to everything to agree with Kurt Vonnegut is there's only one rule that I know of, God damn it, you gotta be kind. Or as the 14th Dalai Lama put it, be kind whenever it is possible. It is always possible. Um, <clears throat> and somebody who knows more about other people than most people is uh, my dear friend Brandon, who uh, is a very insightful and wise man and very observant man and is the human behind Humans of New York. Brandon. Thank you. Um, very happy to be here. Uh, have you guys looked at this book yet? It is freaking awesome. I, I, I told Oliver I think it's the Mona Lisa of kids books. Uh, this is coming from somebody, I have a best-selling kids book. My book is a watercolor. This is the Mona Lisa of kids books. So I'm very, I'm very honored to be here. Um, when Oliver sent me an email uh, asking if I wanted to come, I had just seen the Bruce Springsteen one-man Broadway show the day before, and so um, I think he sent everybody else like more instructions on what to choose, but I had just seen that, so I'm like, I'm going to read Bruce Springsteen. It's going to be awesome. So um, there was a, a passage. It's, a lot of the show is kind of taken from his life and from his book, and there was this one part of it that just really messed me up like in a good way. Um, and he was talking about his father. And his father is a, you know, a very kind of uh, a not too admirable character. He was an alcoholic. Um, he didn't give Bruce much attention. Bruce was always pulling him out of bars. And, you know, Bruce kind of did this monologue taken from the book that I'm going to read. Um, it's actually, I discovered it was in two different parts of the book um, that I'm going to blend together where he talks about his relationship with his father. He said, I was not my father's favorite citizen. As a boy, I figured it was just the way men were, distant, uncommunicative, busy with the currents of the grown-up world. As a child, you don't question your parents' choices. You accept them. They are justified by the godlike status of parenthood. If you aren't spoken to, you're not worth the time. If you're not greeted with love and affection, you haven't earned it. If you're ignored, you don't exist. Control over your own behavior is the only card you have to play in the hope of modifying theirs. Maybe you have to be tougher, stronger, more athletic, smarter, in some way better. Who knows? 
One evening, my father was, father was giving me a few boxing lessons in the living room. I was flattered, excited by his attention and eager to learn. Things were going well, and then he threw a few open-palmed punches to my face and landed just a little too hard. It stung. I wasn't hurt, but a line had been crossed. I knew something was being communicated. We had slipped into the dark netherland beyond father and son. I sensed what was being said. I was an intruder, a stranger, a competitor in our home and a fearful disappointment. My heart broke and I crumpled. He walked away in disgust. And the second paragraph is from the end of the book. Um, he writes it after his father dies. Those whose love we wanted but could not get, we emulate. It is dangerous, but it makes us feel closer. It gives us an illusion of the intimacy we never had. It stakes our claim upon that which was rightfully ours but denied. In my twenties, as my song and my story began to take shape, I searched for the voice I would blend with mine to do the telling. It is a moment when through creativity and will you can rework, repossess, and rebirth the conflicting voices of your childhood to turn them into something alive, powerful, and seeking light. I'm a repairman. That's part of my job. <clears throat> So I, who'd never done a week's worth of manual labor in his life, hail rock and roll, put on a factory worker's clothes, my father's clothes, and went to work. One night I had a dream. I'm on stage in full flight. The night is burning and my dad, long dead, sits quietly in an aisle seat in the audience. Then I'm kneeling next to him in the aisle and for a moment, we both watch the man on fire on stage. I touch his forearm and say to my dad, who for so many years sat paralyzed with depression, look, dad, look, that guy on stage, that's you. That's how I see you. Um, so I am I'm lucky enough to live and work in New York, uh, which I think is home of the center of the art world. Uh, the greatest art that's being made, I think, is happening here. Um, I think the, the greatest ideas that are happening are happening here first before anywhere else. And it's, as, as such, it's filled with many, many wonderful artists and many, many wonderful talents. And I'm lucky and fortunate enough to consider some of them friends. And one of those friends is my dear friend, Sophie Blackall, who I consider to be one of the, the best pencils in the business, the best paintbrushes in the business, who makes art like, like no one else, frankly, um, and who I look up to. And I am I'm honored that we, we share similar thought cycles. Uh, and I would please like to welcome Sophie Blackall to the stage. <laughs> I'm very happy to be here and so happy to see this book out in the world. I got to see it in early, early stages um, and, uh, and it's beautiful. And you get to see it before most other people, so that's very exciting. Um, I'm going to read from uh, Thornton Wilder's Our Town. Uh, my partner, the playwright Ed Schmidt, uh, did a play called My Last Play in which he gave away all of his books and invited people into his home and during the intermission they would take a book and the play ran until the shelves were bare and most people thought he must be insane or dying or both because who would give away their books? Um, I went uh, officially to the play about halfway through its run. And I thought, oh, I won't take a book. And then I thought, I will take a book. And in his play, he ended with the last scene from Our Town. And miraculously, nobody had taken his copy of Our Town that was still on the shelf, so I got it. I am told Our Town is the kind of play that even the worst actor in the world can't ruin, so we'll see about that. <laughs> Emily, in a loud voice to the stage manager. I can't, I can't go on, it goes so fast. We don't have time to look at one another. She breaks down sobbing. The lights dim on the left half of the stage. Mrs. Webb disappears. I didn't realize, 
So all that was going on and we never noticed. Take me back up the hill to my grave. But first, wait, one more look. Goodbye, goodbye world. Goodbye Grover's Corners, Mama and Papa. Goodbye to clocks ticking and Mama's sunflowers and food and coffee and new iron dresses and hot baths and sleeping and waking up. Oh, Earth, you're too wonderful for anybody to realize you. She looks toward the stage manager and asks abruptly through her tears, do any human beings ever realize life when they live it every, every minute? No. The saints and poets, maybe, they do some. I'm ready to go back. She returns to her chair beside Mrs. Gibbs. Were you happy? No, I should have listened to you. That's all human beings are, just blind people. Look, it's clearing up. The stars are coming out. Oh, Mr. Stimson, I should have listened to them. Yes, now you know. Now you know that's what it was to be alive, to move about in a cloud of ignorance, to go up and down trampling on the feelings of, of those about you, to spend and waste time as though you had a million years, to be always at the mercy of one self-centered passion or another. Now you know that's the happy existence you wanted to go back to, ignorance and blindness. Simon Stimson, that ain't the whole truth and you know it. Emily, look at that star. I forget its name. My boy Joel was a sailor, knew them all. He'd sit on the porch evenings and tell them all by name. Yes, sir, wonderful. A star's mighty good company. Yep, yes it is. Here's one of them coming. That's funny, taint no time for one of them to be here, goodness sakes. Mother Gibbs, it's George. Shh, dear, just rest yourself. It's George. George enters from the left and slowly moves towards them. And my boy Joel, who knew the stars, he used to say it took millions of years for that speck of light to get to the Earth. Don't seem like a body could believe it, but that's what he used to say, millions of years. George sinks to his knees, then falls full length at Emily's feet. Goodness, that ain't no way to behave. He ought to be home. Mother Gibbs, yes, Emily. They don't understand, do they? No, dear, they don't understand. The stage manager appears at the right, one hand on a dark curtain, which he slowly draws across the scene. In the distance, a clock is heard striking the hour very faintly. Most everybody's asleep in Grover's Corners. There are a few lights on. Shorty Hawkins, down at the depot, has just watched the Albany train go by. And at the livery stable, someone's setting up late and talking. Yes, it's clearing up. There are the stars doing their old, old crisscross journeys in the sky. Scholars haven't settled the matter yet, but they seem to think there are no living beings up there, just chalk or fire. Only this one is straining away straining all the time to make something of itself. The strain's so bad that every 16 hours, everybody lies down and gets a rest. He winds his watch. Hmm, 11 o'clock in Grover's Corners. You get a good rest too. Good night. Okay, uh, I'm going to attempt to read my book now, but uh, I, I'm actually going to ask for some help with this. Um, this book was, is written for my son, uh, <clears throat> and he's in the audience somewhere. Uh, so I think, is he, is he coming? Okay. Uh, I think, yeah, we're, we're going to try and read it together. Well, I'll read it to him. He can't read yet. Where is he? All right, come on up. Come on. Okay, Pop. Now, have you read this book before? Yes. No, you're supposed to say no. <laughs> okay. So, who wrote this book? Daddy. Daddy. And who's it for? Ireland. Yeah. 
Well, hello. Welcome to this planet. We call it Earth. Welcome, everybody. <laughs> it's the big globe floating in space on which we live. Mama? And if you've, if you've got this book, you can follow Mama. along. Yeah, Mama's there somewhere. Where's Mama? We have Mama. There she is here. We're glad you found us. The space is very big. There is much to see and do here on Earth, so let's get started with a quick tour. The planet is basically made up of two parts, a microphone and an audience. <laughs> land and sea. Firstly, let's talk about the land. It's what we're standing on right now. We know lots where's, about the land. Where's my, where's, where's, where's my dodo? Where's your dodo? I don't know. Oh, you don't need a dodo. No. That's a pacifier in Irish. Okay. Then there is the sea, which is full of wonderful things. What do you, what do you see in the sea? Boat. You see a boat, yes, a and a whale, and a whale, yes. What else? Some other stuff? We know a little bit about the sea, but we'll talk about that some more once you've learned to swim. It's a crab. It is a crab, yes. And there's a shark and a Not turtle. Look, there's a crab and crab. There's two crabs, you're right. Well, one's technically a lobster, and anybody from Maine will like to correct the difference. <laughs> so, there is also the sky, though that can get pretty complicated. Mama. And, uh, Mama. yeah, this, is, this information is all probably wrong. I mean, the stratus Mama. thingy. Now, Mama's there. Do you want Mama to come up? Yeah. She doesn't want to come up. <laughs> okay, moving on. On our planet, there are people. One people is a person. You are a person. You have a body. Look after it, as most bits don't grow back. OK. We haven't finished yet. Thank you, Harland. Where are you going to go? Do you want to go? Do you see Hannah over there? Oh, well, I'll, I'll read to you then. <laughs> and I'll stay sitting. The most important things for people to remember are to eat, drink, and stay warm. People come in many shapes, sizes, and colors. We may all look different, act different, and sound different, but don't be fooled. We are all people. There are animals, too. They come in even more shapes, sizes, and colors. They can't speak, though that's no reason not to be nice to them. You may not be able to speak yet, either. And this applies to more than just my son. Even though your head is filled with questions, but be patient. You'll learn how to use words soon enough. Generally, how it works is when the sun is out, it is daytime, and we do stuff. The rest of the time is night, when it's dark, save for the moon, and we sleep. Please. Please. <laughs> Things can move slowly sometimes here on Earth. More often, though, they move quickly. So use your time well. It will be gone before you know it. Though we have come a long way, we haven't quite worked everything out, so there is plenty left for you to do. You'll figure lots of things out for yourself, just remember to leave notes for everyone else. It looks big, Earth, but there are lots of us on here. 7,327,450,667 and counting. So be kind. There is enough for everyone, technically. Well, that is planet Earth. Make sure you look after it, as it's all we've got. Now, if you need to know anything else, just ask. I won't be far away. And when I'm not around, you can always ask someone else. And this is Harlan's family. Is he around to identify people? Probably not. Oh, he's away back there. You're never alone on Earth. And I would like to close this, uh, this reading with uh, one final piece that I have left. Oh, no, it's in my pocket. Um, and this, uh, this sort of, Harlan, do you want to come back and identify your family? <laughs> come here. Let's just see how this goes. OK. Come here. Dodo. Yes, no. He just wanted his dodo. OK. Who's that? This is going to go Hi. terribly. Yes. Hi. Do you want to say hello to everybody again? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's not do that. Do you want to just sit here while I read something else totally different? Mm -hmm. Okay. We're going to read this. Isn't this a lovely fun picture book? 
Um, this is from a piece of writing uh, by Carl Sagan, who Maria pointed out, it's actually his, would have been his, what birthday? I don't know. It was his birthday today. It would have been 83. 83 today. Carl Sagan, one of the, the great sages of our time, um, wrote a, a book, uh, uh, yes, that's a microphone. Uh, this pale blue dot about the, the, the history and the future of, of civilization and its role in cosmology. Yeah. Do you want to come? Yeah, why don't you go sit with Hannah? Uh, and this, this book sort of um, was one of the, the more important things that I read when I was uh, creating this picture book. Uh, and it's a piece of writing that you probably all know. Um, and it goes a little bit like this. From this distance vantage point, looking at outer space from a great distance, the Earth might not seem of particular interest. But for us, it's different. Consider again that dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and card, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on a moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam. The earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors so that in glory and triumph, they could become the momentary masters of a fraction of a dot. Think of the endless cruelties visited by the inhabitants of one corner of this pixel on the scarcely distinguishable inhabitants of some other corner. How frequent their misunderstandings, how eager they are to kill one another, how fervent their hatreds. Our posturings, our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe are challenged by this point of pale light. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity, in all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. The Earth is the only known world so far to harbor life. There is nowhere else, at least in the near future, to which our species could migrate. Visit, yes, settle, not yet. Like it or not, for the moment, the Earth is where we make our stand. It has been said that astron astronomy is a humbling and character-building experience. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot the only home we've ever known. Thank you, everybody.